Hello and welcome to this broadcast by Brexit Watch. I'm your host, Jonathan Saxe. Today we are delighted to welcome the senior Conservative politician, Sir John Redwood. Sir John has been the MP for Wokingham since 1987. He has served as Secretary of State for Wales, as well as having served in the shadow cabinets of both uh, William Hague and Michael Howard. Sir John, welcome to Brexit Watch. Thank you. Uh, Sir John, let me take this opportunity to wish you and your family well during this unprecedented coronavirus crisis. Uh, can I begin by asking, before we get into the nuts and bolts of our discussion, how you and your work have been impacted by the crisis over the last few weeks? There's been a, a big increase in, in the amount of the casework and contact electronically with constituents because the government is having such a dramatically increased impact on everybody's lives with controls and with assistance systems, people need more guidance and, and they need to refer through their MP to the government on a much more dramatic basis than they have in my constituency in the past. So there's been a lot more to do uh, and I haven't had all the travel to do <laughs> because of course I'm like everybody else uh, locked into my house and so the time I've saved on the travel is going on answering more of the emails and putting out more messages and informing people. And I'm, I'm trying to meet as many people as possible electronically. Uh, so I've been downloading all sorts of systems to have these conference calls uh, with groups of people uh, and more energetic than ever on my website, putting out daily messages, analysis, stories, uh, and I trust in some cases comfort to people about what is happening how they can be assisted and where they should go to get the help they need. So yes, it has transformed my life as everybody else's life, uh, but I'm one of the lucky group because my salary is paid anyway. My job is not immediately at risk uh, in the way that so many people's jobs are at risk in the private sector. Uh, and I have a comfortable home that I can work from with the technology to assist me. So I'm well aware that there are many people who are suffering badly economically and some who are suffering badly from the medical problems and those are the ones that we're trying to help. And we'll get on to the consequences of the crisis um, fairly soon, but sticking with the crisis, um, John, how would you assess the government's handling of the coronavirus crisis so far, certainly compared to other Western nations? The government's been uh, performing in a very similar way, I think, to the main Western nations I and mean, all the Western nations are following very similar advice. Uh, it's advice that it is coming from the World Health Organization and from the groups of experts in the leading universities and advisory groups around the world who uh, meet electronically and collectively through the World, world Health Organization and various conferences and are obviously spreading best practice and intelligence as they grapple with a, a new virus whose characteristics are not fully understood. So I think the British government has followed a very similar approach to many of the other Western countries. It seems that some parts of Europe have worse incidence of the disease than others. And I think the, the main variation seems to be in the intensity of the disease and the extent to which it has spread. I'm not sure it's mainly to do with government responses. Uh, but we need to study more to find out why some populations are more susceptible to it than others and to understand more how flare points occur in, in different countries. It's very obvious that Italy had a particularly bad dose in the Lombardy area, um, parts of Spain were very badly affected and some parts of the UK have been badly affected, whereas Germany seems to have had milder experiences of it. Um, there may be something to learn from the way the German government handled it, but it may also be something to do with how the virus arrived in Europe uh, and where it concentrated. And how do you see the easing of lockdown proceeding? Well, I want that to go as quickly as possible for economic reasons. Of course, I accept that the overriding priority is to get the death rate down and try to control the spread of the virus. Uh, but governments have to do difficult things, so they, they need both an antivirus policy and an economic policy that means there's a way of earning our livings and making sure that food is on the table and people have shelter that they can afford to pay for. So I'm pleased that the government is now moving on to the second 
phase where uh, we need a, a careful return to work. I've always wanted it to be done on a new basis so that we can uh, take safety into account as, as well as the need to make things, sell things and let people rescue their livelihoods. But we do need to go on to this second phase now uh, because livelihoods are at risk. Too many people already lost their jobs mm -hmm. and you cannot go on indefinitely expecting a first world living standard if a quarter or a half of your economy is not functioning because you're simply not earning the money and producing the goods and services to maintain that living standard. So what do you see as the as the medium to long term uh, economic and potentially political consequences of both the virus and of course the lockdown? It's too early to say because we're only part of the way through this dreadful crisis. I'm one of those who thinks this is going to change quite a lot. And I think the good side of it, in the context of the horrors of the, the disease and the economic impact, is that I think it will accelerate new methods of working and uh, new ways of delivering service and uh, providing decent living standards to people, which in the medium to longer term will be very helpful. I mean, I think uh, it may well be, for example, that as we come out of this, there will be more home working and people won't expect to go uh, to an office five days a week um, and have to commute at regular times when everybody else wants to travel. So there may be an improvement in people's lives in terms of travel patterns mm. and there may be more use of their homes for uh, business and commercial purposes. That, that could, could be a win for quite a lot of people. But there will always be other people who do need to go to a place to work on a very regular basis. And if you're in a factory environment, um, you will need to go to the factory, but I suspect factories will continue on the path they were on before the virus hit, which is to more and more automation in factories and more and more people who have jobs in industry will be in the kind of jobs in sales, marketing, technology, product development and so forth, where they too can do some of their work at home. That they won't always need to go to the office by the factory. So I think there will be quite a lot of changes, some of which might produce uh, improved ways of earning your livelihood and if we apply the technology correctly we may get boost productivity which could uh, also provide boost to income but in the short term we have this massive deflation we have this huge supply and demand side shock as economists say uh, which is a fancy way of saying that people were banned from earning their livings and that uh, a whole, whole load of things are not going to be made and a whole lot of services are not going to be provided. So there's a lot of lost haircuts and a lot of lost beauty treatments and a lot of lost non-urgent medical treatments that simply haven't taken place. Uh, and we need to pick up the position as soon as we can and get back to a more normal course where people who do those things for us can earn their living and we can benefit from the services they supply. What lessons do you think can be learned both um, by government and by business from this crisis, and by the fallout? Well, again, it's very early to work out what the lessons might be because we still don't know what the final outturn is going to be. We all hope for a good outturn, uh, but we could have a second wave of this virus in, in certain places. Um, we may not have fully tamed it. It may take longer to find treatments and vaccinations, which will provide a more permanent answer to the threat of the virus. Uh, and we still have to live through um, this dreadful second quarter uh, economically, when the figures, when they are reported after June, are going to be dire for most of the major economies of the world. Uh, and the personal cost of that will be seen in lots of people who have actually lost their jobs, uh, people who are nervous about restarting their jobs because they're mm -hmm. under a furlough or a state assistance scheme in their, in their country uh, and people whose incomes have taken a hit even though they've kept their job because if you're on commission selling things or if you're on bonuses related to your activity uh, you've taken a big hit on your income uh, because you haven't been able to earn the top up uh, over the rather modest salary you might have been on. So all that is pain to come, uh, which is not good. And that's why, again, we need a safe return to work as quickly as possible. 
uh, because you can put up with one quarter of that maybe, but you can't put up with three, four quarters of that. Mm. Mm. Now, yeah. how do you see? How, sorry, and how do you see this all impacting the government's agenda? It seems a, uh, you know, quite a while since we saw uh, the promises of, uh, earlier in the year. How do you think the government's agenda is going to be impacted by this whole crisis and lockdown? Well, all, all Western governments have been hit in the same way. And so those of us who have agendas to get more people into work and to get them into better paid work and encourage them to be better trained so that they can earn more to create greater prosperity have taken a massive blow because mm. governments had to impose policies that achieve exactly the opposite outcome that are uniquely damaging. None, none of us in our adult lives have seen governments before enact policies that are desperately bad for the economies and for jobs that they felt they had to in order to get the death rate down. Many people agree that the main priority is to try and keep more people alive. So those difficult choices were made. Uh, and I'm sure the UK government um, wants to get back to its proper agenda as quickly as possible. And I don't think there's much of an argument going on. I've seen some press stories that some people in the Treasury, I presume officials, have been talking about a combination of tax increases and spending cuts. I don't think that's on the agenda of the politicians. Uh, we feel that there has to be a one-off borrowing. And as long as this period is relatively short, it, it can be funded, it is affordable, we need to borrow it long, and we're going to be borrowing it at very low interest rates, mm. uh, and get on with the true agenda of promoting growth and prosperity from a worse starting position than we thought. And it doesn't change the agenda you need. You need lower taxes, not higher taxes. You need good public services and some additional um, public sector employees to improve the quality of your healthcare and to make sure people are properly taught and so forth. Uh, so we do have to carry on with that agenda, even though we've had a very big financial hit. Mm. Do you think the crisis has changed public perception of the NHS? Perhaps there'll be even more um, public support for, for um, I mean, you, you mentioned lower taxes, perhaps increased taxes for healthcare. Do you think it's, there's going to be a long term impact on public perception of, of key workers and public services? I think there's a very favourable perception of key workers because a number of our health service workers have, have fought valiantly uh, in the intensive care units to give very good care to people who were very close to death and in some cases went on to die, unfortunately. And we all feel very proud of those health workers and very grateful they are doing what they're doing. But no, I don't think it, it need change the overall view um, on tax and spend, because as I say, I think people on my side of the argument, the conservative side of the argument, are fully persuaded uh, of the need to, to spend sufficient on the health service and have been making big increases in health service spending before this crisis came along. Uh, what we're going to have, um, as and when the, the crisis uh, fades, is we are going to have a, a position where um, there's an awful lot of backlog to be done on the many other conditions uh, that need treating, uh, which have been on the back burner whilst they fought the intensity of the COVID-19, and that will require resource of, of all kinds to clear that backlog and to be good. But I come back to this point that it mustn't be done with higher taxes, because there's this other overriding priority now to say to the enterprising part of the country, Mm. Uh, we've given you a very nasty knock for the best mm. of public health reasons. We're very conscious mm. of that. It wasn't your fault. Mm. So the last thing we're going to do is take more money off you. We're going to get behind you and the nation has to borrow a bit mm. uh, during this recovery period, uh, which will be paid off over future generations. And, and that's the only way you can do it fairly. And it's a great mercy that interest rates are so low, so the cost of this debt will, will not be crippling. And apart from, on that point, apart from lower taxes, are there any other measures the government could take to help entrepreneurs, innovators and small businesses? Well, I think there are. And the, the bit of optimism I was trying to take out of this awful crisis about transforming the way we, we work and the way we carry out our lives provides huge commercial opportunity. 
and government can play its role. I think government needs to transform the way the public sector does its work. We don't necessarily need all these people going into the centres of big cities and, and working in big office blocks. We may be able to work more flexibly in the public sector as well as the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that means a major commitment of resource to the technology and the technical services that are going to be required. Quite a lot of that be supplied by the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and to encourage whole industries that I think have opportunities. I mean, let, let's take uh, a couple of obvious ones as we come out of the EU. I mean, the first is farming. Uh, we've lost an awful lot of market share in the food we were growing and rearing over our period in the common agricultural policy. We, uh, we've allowed much more of our food to be imported. I think there's a big opportunity now to have more resilience by growing and rearing more of our own food at home. And some of that requires technology. Uh, we can employ more local workers, but we can also use a lot more technology to do some of the low paid jobs uh, using better farm machinery and some of the money we're going to be putting into agriculture now back under our control once we're out of the EU should be used for those purposes of encouraging a stronger and more mechanized uh, local system of farming and I hope we'll have a lot more greenhouses I think we can substitute for a lot of the Dutch and Spanish products fruit and vegetables uh, domestically grown uh, in more intensive units in the UK which would be very welcome and may require some government support on the the investment funding and then there's the fishing industry uh, where I hope there will be government schemes to promote more British boats and more sale of fish uh, direct to the British public because one of the curious things that's happened during this period of lockdown uh, is that fishermen have been saying they can't sell all their fish because it turns out they've been selling an awful lot of them on the continent to the restaurant trade which has just collapsed whereas there are many of us sitting at home who would love to buy <laughs> More, uh, more English fish. Um, mm -hmm. And there's difficulty in having enough wet fish counters uh, in the supermarkets or in finding other mm -hmm. ways to get the, the fresh fish to people um, in, in a way which we can use and enjoy. So I think we need to work on that so that we can have a bigger fishing industry catching more of our own fish, uh, whilst having better controls over foreign access to the water so we don't overfish. And we need to solve this problem, how we get retail distribution for that. Mm. And that leads quite well into Brexit. Before we, before we go into that, just sticking with coronavirus um, for, for a moment more. Um, obviously, there have been calls for China to be held to account. Lots of backlash against that particular country. Uh, how do you see the crisis impacting both Britain and the Western world's relationship with China? You think, for example, of Huawei here in the UK. How do you think that could play out? I think there was a very sharp deterioration in relations with China uh, by the West before the virus hit. And the, the main flare points uh, were over technology uh, and access to Western systems and uh, whether China was taking Western technology on the cheap or, or even by theft. Um, and Mr. Trump, from the United States of America was making it very clear that he thought he had got proof that China wasn't playing fair on technology and he was trying to get the Western allies to take a much tougher line uh, over some of the ways in which China were, were getting into our systems but they weren't offering similar access to their systems and sometimes they were acquiring technology from Western companies uh, in ways that the president didn't like. And I think Britain will have to listen more carefully to what Mr. Trump is saying, because I think quite a lot in what Mr. Trump has been saying. And I think there will be uh, a digital divide or iron curtain descend. I think mm -hmm. it is descending. So I think there will be a Chinese led system where um, poorer countries in Asia and Africa who are beholden to China will be on the Chinese system. And then there's the rest of the world system, which will be led by the great American corporations. And I hope there will also be. British success stories in that field because there's plenty of opportunity uh, because we need to have systems which are, are safe and which we share with allies rather than with a power like China where people don't necessarily want China to be privy to all our secrets. So I think that's going to happen anyway. Um, I don't want to add to the tensions by talking about how China behaved over the virus. Mr. Trump has his own view on that where he thinks that China didn't control it well 
uh, in the early days, which is adding to the tensions between America and China. And I see this week there's more news that um, Mr. Trump is now getting more aggressive in trying to get Dubai out of West systems and also uh, limiting the supply of chips where he has some control over that. Now, leaving coronavirus um, for a moment, I said we would go get on to Brexit, and so we shall. Obviously, um, the latest round of the uh, transition negotiations ends today. Uh, from what we hear in the press, the negotiations have uh, hit a few snags. What would be your overall impression of how the transition negotiations have gone between the UK and the well, I'm delighted that the, the UK under the Prime Minister, Mr. Frost, uh, has been robust up to this point, because I think we lacked robust negotiations under the previous government, which is one of the reasons why I did want to change the Prime Minister, uh, because having myself negotiated in the past as single market minister in Brussels, I'm very well aware that they only take you seriously if you dig in and if you are consistent. Mm -hmm. If they think you're going to give in, they just keep on applying pressure until you do give in. And then that indicates their view that they could dictate and they don't have to listen seriously to the other side. Now the UK needed to change that mood because there, there was a feeling that all they had to do was dig in and insist and the previous government would agree. And so it's very important this government establishes that that isn't the way it's now working. I think it's coming as a shock to the EU to discover that this government does wish to implement Brexit. Uh, of the kind that we Brexit voters voted for, and we did not vote to replicate most features of our relationship with the EU in a new comprehensive agreement or treaty, um, where the only main difference was we no longer had a vote or voice around the table. That isn't what we had in mind at all. We wished to be an independent country, uh, trading in as free a way as possible with our European neighbours and being friendly with them and having a range of agreements over cooperations, but making it very clear that Britain has a veto over everything, just as they have a veto over everything, and we need to agree issue by issue. Um, there isn't going to be a subservience anymore of the United Kingdom to the European view and the enforcement of the European Court of Justice. There will be um, quite a lot of people out there who would say, well, the coronavirus crisis has, um, has everyone's attention has gone in that direction. It's all, all hands to the pump, as it were. And because of that, the, the uh, transition uh, deadline must be pushed back. What do you say to those who say we ought to extend the transition deadline? Well, I think they've always been wrong, and I think they're even more wrong now. And the, the kind of silly forecasts they made of the damage that would be done uh, if we simply left, I think we're always wrong. And they were exaggerated or simply false. Uh, and they were expecting some kind of damage to our car industry, for example, or some mm. uh, reduction in our trade or whatever. That the numbers, even they were painting in their more lurid explanations, have completely been swamped by what's happened mm. as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. We just had a period of several weeks when all the car plants everywhere in Europe have been closed. And our, our car market fell 97% in the yep. UK last month. This, this has completely transformed the debate. Uh, we need to get on with our successful exit from the European Union in all respects at the end of this year, as promised. And I don't believe that will have any ill consequences on our economy. Uh, I would hope that as they see our resolution, uh, they would want a free trade agreement with us. The UK is very willing to have a free trade agreement, but if by any chance they misjudge it and they don't give us that by the end of the year, we will trade perfectly successfully under world trade rules mm. uh, and we will make our decisions about whether we wish to impose tariffs on them or not and they will make their decisions as appropriately um, there aren't very large tariffs on most of the things we trade with the european union anyway indeed a lot of them are zero rated under the current rules and arrangements under the wto so i don't see any major problems at all and I see plenty of opportunity as and when the European Union recognises that they have a very friendly and important trading partner, mm. a partner that buys a lot more of their things than we sell to them. And so they'd be very wise in their own interests to have that free trade agreement. When we look across the channel, we see quite a lot of internal 
problems um, for the EU. We've seen, we saw budgetary turmoil uh, even before the coronavirus crisis. Uh, we've seen the corona, bu uh, corona bonds debacle recently, the uh, division between the uh, more frugal Northern European countries such as uh, Germany and the Netherlands and the, and the uh, Italians and Spaniards who've obviously been hit very hard. What do you think of the impact of this crisis could be on the EU, the Eurozone itself? Well, I wish our neighbours success. And, and one of my reasons for wanting the UK to leave the European Union was I knew that uh, I and our, all our fellow countrymen and women uh, were never going to join the Euro. And the Euro is a central feature of the integration which they seek for their zone. And I think we were sort of living a lie in the EU, but not wishing to join the euro and there were more and more meetings where they needed to take decisions for the sake of the euro but we couldn't go along with the decision or we weren't even in the room because it was no longer relevant to us i think getting out of their way will help them crystallize the issue because as you rightly say there is a big dispute between uh, the northern surplus countries uh, who don't wish to share their money with the with the south and the deficit countries uh, and those that feel that European solidarity and a successful single currency requires sharing money around a currency zone. Obviously, in a big currency zone like the dollar zone in America or the sterling currency zone in the United Kingdom, um, we don't look at which bits have a balance of payment surplus and which have a balance of payments deficit with each other. We just simply supply the money uh, to the deficit bits from the, uh, from the surplus bits. Uh, and where part of our currency union is poorer than other parts, then it receives proportionately yeah. more government grant and assistance out of general taxation, which is levied more, more severely on the richer parts. Now, yeah. if they don't want that model, mm. um, they've got serious problems. And, yeah. and that's why they've had periodic euro crises, because yeah. the surplus and rich parts of the zone have been unwilling to share their money in mm. the way that normally happens. Mm. How has it survived as long as it has? Well, they've come up with this system whereby Germany, Netherlands, Austria, the other surplus countries deposit their surplus in the European Central Bank mm. and it's lent on at zero interest to the deficit countries. Yeah. Um, but there's not a proper acknowledgement of that and arguably it should have been a grant, not a loan. It only works because we currently have zero interest rates in the same which makes it tolerable from the point of view of the deficit countries. And that's what they're puzzling away at. Mm. And as you rightly say, there's been an effort to say, well, actually, yes, we do need to pull more of our risks and our liabilities. So let's borrow collectively um, so that Germany has to stand behind the borrowing as well as Italy standing behind mm. the borrowing. But we spend more of the borrowing in Italy because they've got more of a financial need. And it looks as if Germany is going to carry on vetoing that approach. Mm. And we now have this amazing attempt at a pushback by the Germans through their constitutional court. I was just about to say that, yeah. <laughs> we don't even want the European Central Bank yeah. keeping Italian interest rates as low as they are. Yeah. And they'd be kept low by the European Central Bank buying up Italian state bonds. And the Germans are saying, well, hold on a minute, I think you're buying too many of these things. And maybe this isn't very helpful. And maybe Italy should have to pay the full price because it's not. Uh, in such a good financial state as we are. And again, that isn't terribly communitaire. It doesn't show a lot of solidarity. No. Uh, and the EU will have to deal with that. And if it wishes to make a success of its currency, and I hope it does, um, then it will need to say to the Germans, well, I'm afraid you are in this with the Italians and the Italians need help at the moment. Mm. What do you see as the, as the ramifications of that ruling by the constitutional court? Do you think it could encourage the um, other countries to follow suit? No, I don't think so. And I, I assume the EU will deal with what is a, a German rebellion against the, the EU system. And, and I think there's an obvious way out because the, um, the Europeans can produce some kind of a report saying that the European Central Bank behaved perfectly sensibly. And the German government could say, we have considered this and we are uh, in agreement with them because it rests now with the German government. The court has mandated any action other than the, the German government should consider the ECB's response and decide whether they were doing the right thing or not. So they've given a way out to the German government and you'd imagine the German government would want stable markets and would support it. The issue I suppose is will the ECB and the EU even bother to reply in the form that the court judgment requires 
or will they try and slap down the court in another way? And that's the question of how many fireworks they want and whether they wish to inflame German opinion more or not. I wonder also if the Euro Federalists um, may feel emboldened in a way, may see the, uh, the fact that the national governments have had to answer to national constituencies, which has caused many of the problems we've seen. Perhaps they will say, well, this is a reason for yet more Europe. We need more integration, precisely because national governments have had to answer to national constituencies. Well, I think, I think they're right. I mean, if you believe in this project, as you know, I don't, but if you believe in this project, um, you must want more integration and, and you cannot have a single currency, in my view, that is successful without integrating the budgets, the tax system, the spending system. There has to be a federal budget and there has to be federal taxation. There's only embryo amounts of that at the moment. It has to be done on a significant enough scale so that if the Italian economy or the Greek economy gets into really big difficulties, the federal state can marshal resources and mobilise programs uh, to get them out of high unemployment or low incomes or, or whatever the problem is, whereas that hasn't happened at European level because they, they went for the integration of a single currency without the proper integration of budgets uh, and expenditure plans uh, that you need in a normal currency area. Do you think the Italians are in serious trouble? Well, I think the Italians have been suffering from the scheme for quite a long time. Um, Hence, the very high levels of youth unemployment that we saw mm. even before the crisis and pretty high levels of overall unemployment. There's always been an issue about the gap between the north and the south in Italy, where the south has, has struggled um, against the north, but the whole of Italy is struggling against the competitive Germany uh, and has been buying too much German product, which they can't really afford, and then causing financial system problems. And there are weak Italian weak. banks. So yes, I think Italy has had a really dreadful decade or so, uh, where its living standards are still lower than they were before the great banking crash at the end of the last decade. Uh, and now they've had another very bad round with a particularly bad outbreak of the virus, quite a long period of lockdown, uh, which is going to mean even worse economic figures coming out of Italy over the summer. And of course, a lot of those Southern European countries are quite dependent on a summer tourism trade. So that's going to be, I imagine the aviation and tourism industry is going, well, we know the aviation and tourism industry, travel and tourism has taken an enormous hit. And that's obviously going to be a, a real hit this summer for the, for the South Europeans. Yes, it is. Um, uh, Italy, Spain, and of course, France itself, which is a very big visitor destination, are all very badly hit by this. And no immediate prospects of being able to return that to anything like normal because of social distancing rules and absolute bans. Now, bringing things back to the to the UK and our current negotiations, um, aside from the negotiations with uh, with uh, the with the EU, we've we've heard that there are negotiations beginning between the UK and the US, led by Liz Truss on the on the UK side. Uh, what are your hopes uh, for for that, and how, how do you see those progressing? I think there's a good chance uh, of an agreement about quite a lot that could be signed before President Trump has to face re-election, which is, I guess, one of the aims on, on the American side. Um, and I think uh, we've got a very good trading relationship with the United States of America already. They are our single most important trade partner in terms of individual countries. Uh, and it's been growing well, that trade, and we're in surplus quite a lot of the time on that mm -hmm. trade. So it's sort of very, very good trade from the, the UK point of view all around. Um, and I, I trust the government's got plenty of goodwill to try and get a deal done, just as I think Mr. Trump has a lot of goodwill to get a deal done. So I'm, I'm hopeful there will be something to show for it before the Trump election, but we'll have to see because it, it's complicated. There are about 100 people involved, I believe, in the negotiations on each side, and there are a whole, whole series of chapters because they're starting off looking at a very ambitious project. Uh, but it may be that both sides would like to have at least something in agreement before the end of the year, because in, in both countries' cases, there'll be some merit in doing that. So that's why I'm optimistic. And what about uh, potential trade deals with other countries? Uh, the Commonwealth has been mentioned, I think Japan too. Do you see these as, have a lot of hope for these as well? Oh, yes, indeed. I think uh, Australia and New Zealand are extremely keen to have free trade agreements with us. And they've been remarkably good about it all, because obviously our entry into the EU damaged our trade with them very dramatically in the 1970s, but they've forgiven us over that and they're very positive about 
being able to have a much better relationship with us once we come out. Uh, I think Japan is pretty enthusiastic and that could broaden out into an agreement with the TPP, the whole Pacific Partnership area, which America didn't decide to progress. And they would quite like to have the UK in that. So I think, yes, there's plenty of opportunity. And as I understand it, this Justice Department is very keen to get on with those. It's a reasonably big department uh, and it should be able to conduct several of these at the same time. And I wonder if the coronavirus crisis has meant that uh, it almost makes these deals even more uh, necessary uh, in order to get things moving. Yes, I think every little helps, doesn't it? I mean, I, I think you get a pretty good deal out of the World Trade Organization. So during all those long Brexit debates, they've always said, I have no fear of us trading under World Trade Organization rules with no specific free trade agreement, because that, of course, is what we do with quite a lot of countries at the moment as members of the EU system. So we, we don't have free trade agreements with America and China and so forth. Yet they're very big trade partners and we have a fairly good trade with them. But if you can get a free trade agreement on top, yes, it, it does give it a bit more oomph. And the more oomph, the better at the moment, as you say. And uh, finally on Brexit, um, obviously the Downing Street have been absolutely adamant that they will not uh, extend the uh, transition deadline. This question is in two parts. A, uh, what do you think of the chances that the EU will ask for an extension? And B, I think I know the answer to B, uh, what do you think London's response would be to such a request? I think the EU still believes we'll be forced into asking for an extension because they have this strange idea that we are going to be damaged, whereas I stand by that idea. I think we have a perfectly good future uh, with World Trade support from the WTO. Um, so I don't think uh, they're going to get that. I'd be a bit surprised if they climbed down and asked for extension themselves, and I trust we would say certainly not. And tying everything together, we've discussed um, coronavirus and uh, Brexit, but particularly on the coronavirus side, if you had one major economic or political prediction for this country for the next uh, six, 12 months, perhaps the rest of 2020, what would that prediction or forecast be? Things can only get better, I think, is my forecast today, because we must be somewhere near the, the nadir, the worst on the economic news, because as we progressively relax and get more people back to work, so the numbers will start to improve. But the numbers we're about to hear uh, for April and May are going to be dire. Mm. So it can only get better. And that those numbers will, of course, be dire for everybody. Yes, all they're countries. dire all around the world. They well, are numbers uh, worse than we could even imagine, let mm. alone than we've ever mm. seen. As, as someone who's been involved over many years in watching the great economies and making forecasts and estimates of what they might do, you've been arguing over will it be plus one, plus two, plus three normally, um, and people are arguing after the decimal point, or if you are facing a downturn or a recession, had to predict one or two of those, you're talking about maybe 5% down. But here we're talking about whether it's 20% down or 30% down, and it's just off the charts. Well, saying things can only get better it sounds like a positive note on which to end. So uh, on that note, I'd like to say thank you to Sir John Redwood uh, for joining us. And thank you for watching. If you'd like to find out more, you can go to www.brexit-watch.org. You can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Until next time. And well done to you and all, all your viewers and listeners, because uh, it's been a great cause and a great campaign, and we will get there. <laughs>